We are now live. So welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on our live stream of Faye Heavy Shields Artist Talk on Facebook Live and Zoom. Uh, while it is always nice to attend a talk in person, it's still pretty great having the opportunity to listen, uh, have people near and far join us and listen in. I'd like to begin by honoring and acknowledging that we live, work and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, and Pekani, the Satina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Metis Nation Region 3, and all of the people who make their home in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We also like to acknowledge our immediate proximity to the Bow River here in Calgary, a site that resonates with us all today and with Indigenous populations for thousands of years. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for making this event possible, in particular our presenting sponsor, Moore, our exhibition benefactor, Gertrude Cohos, exhibition patrons, Warren Jensen and Brenda Silver, Mode Models, and Carol Ryder. So tonight, we are very pleased to welcome one of our most celebrated artists and all around wonderful person, Faye Heavyshield. Faye lives and works in Standoff in Southern Alberta. She is a member of the Kainai and a fluent speaker of the Blackfoot language. Faye acknowledges the influences of land, language, and community on her art. Of note are the old stories told to her in childhood by her grandma, by grandmother, Kate Three Persons. These stories tell the truth of the rivers, the mountains, and the prairies of Blackfoot territory. So tonight's talk is part of our public programming around the exhibition, Growing Freedom, which has two parts, the instructions of John, <clears throat> the instructions of Yoko Ono and the art of John and Yoko. We're thrilled to offer these exhibitions to our Calgary community. Now tonight's presentation is possible because Faye kindly agreed to collaborate with Yoko Ono on our new iteration of Water Event, along with Adrian Stimson, Seth Cardinal Dodging Horse, Jesse Ray Short, Judy Anderson, and Kablusiak. Just a little background on Water Event. In 1971, as part of her first museum exhibition, This Is Not Here, Yoko Ono invited people to produce a water sculpture that she would work on as well establishing a unity between artists. The piece was titled Water Event. And in that first iteration, she invited 120 participants, including the likes of Andy Warhol, George Machunas, Richard Hamilton, and many, many others. Yoko has said of Water Event, it was a Zen joke, I thought. Jokes and laughter are very important elements in Zen. This particular joke is that I get all the containers from the artist to fill them with water. And the water I supply is conceptual, meaning I never fill them with actual water. I like that bit. It gave me a laugh right away as soon as I thought of the idea. I knew then it was a good piece. So when we were tasked with inviting a new group of artists for this current iteration of Water Vent, we immediately knew that it should reflect the enormous significance water has played in our community. And when you consider the long history and impact of the Bow and Elbow Rivers to the Indigenous populations past and present, it seemed the best thing would be to invite artists for whom that connection would resonate in their collaboration with Yoko. And I think you'll find that uh, Faye Heavyshield has worked with water uh, and proximity that, that relationship to the river for a very long time. So uh, I would like now to uh, pass the mic over to you, Faye to share your screen and begin uh, telling us some stories. Um, well, okay, everyone. Um, thanks, Ryan. And thank you to uh, Yoko. Um, I was very happy to, to, to participate in this event. Uh, and to acknowledge, um, I guess, our, our dependence on water. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that project later. Uh, I think for now, I'll just um, say a bit about, about the process that, uh, that I use. Uh, when making art. 
Uh, so some of my thoughts and this is not, um, I had told Ryan and Kate earlier that I'm, I'm not comfortable with making this uh, like a lecture format. Uh, so I've invited Ryan to uh, just to comment or, you know, if you, if you want clarification on something, sure. uh, let me know. Um, and I don't think I need to go into like a history. I mean, you've, of, of my art making from, from the beginning. It's um, it's not mystical by any means. It's um, very ordinary, and I'm happy to say that um, it's that ordinary that really um, uh, rewards me. It fulfills me. Um, I've uh, I've always worked out of my home. Uh, I think once I worked out of um, <clears throat> one of my sisters, uh, I had to use her garage in Calgary because I was working on these long poles that wouldn't fit into my home. Uh, but otherwise, it's always been uh, the basement, or uh, kitchen table, uh, floor, um, or outside. And so it's that. Um, you know, that strength of, uh, of how, how art is ordinary and it should be, you know, it should be part of um, our everyday and uh, not so, uh, I guess, precious. Mm -hmm. I, I did spend uh, four years at, um, well, it was called ACA then in Calgary. And I recall uh, in the first year, one of my instructors was a, a painter by the name of uh, Frank Bervort. And Frank was um, just a really gentle, um, interesting man. And he, he would take us through these drawing exercises and uh, I, I'm now, as I'm talking about him, I'm reminded of, um, you know, this, these quotes that you, you mentioned of Yoko's about it being uh, like about the concept. Mm -hmm. And so I remember one exercise where we were in this classroom for like three hours and and everybody was so in earnest and you know I, I wasn't there till I uh, I think I had turned 30 or something and so I was considered mature you know by everyone else because most of the most of the other students were right out of high school sure. and, and of course they got you know they got accepted into the college because they were so I guess snazzy in in their art making, and so they kind of carried that into into them, you know, into the classroom. Anyhow, um, Frank set up um, this is still life, and he he had us start working on it, and um, so he would use words like "oh, sustain drawing" stuff like that, and so everyone was so um into what they were doing and then at the end uh he said okay well then now take your drawing and you know by then everyone was quite a, you know admiring their work and everything and he said now you just tear up your drawing <laughs> and you know when he said that i swear like it was almost like some were bleeding because it was so well they had put everything in you know what they thought everything up there is into this drawing into this work, uh, but that really that really stayed with me because, um, you know, in well, it really speaks to your talk about the preciousness. Yeah, and it's the art doesn't need to be precious. It can be it that need to everyday be, yeah. one thing. 
And I'm, you know, like everyone to each his own, you know, people paint and they do stonework, stuff like that, it's permanency, monumental, stuff like that. But for me, I think what, what I started to um, understand uh, was that um, later on, um, I began to connect with my history uh, as um as a blackfoot person and and pre-contact we were we didn't stay in one place like we didn't build homes with out of stone or we didn't carve things we didn't uh we weren't in any way um you know in love with permanency because we had to travel and and i think that's an element that I really um, uncomfortable with in my work. And so I'll use, a lot of times I'll use paper. I still really, um, I, am, I really like that humility of that material. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also too, it lends itself to something like when this first image, body, body of land, um, this, um, this lives at the National Gallery right now, but the times I've gone, part of the agreement is that I can add to it at any time. And so usually when I do install it, I'll have new skin to add to it. Or if, like if there's been tears or something, like I'll just fix it. And so it's, um, yeah, and it, back it up, what are we what are we looking at here back up a little bit there when you say skin uh you're referring to the these each, uh, uh cones. each of these cones each one of these cones is a close-up of skin and initially where it started was um just using my own skin you know my hands uh and then I think at the beginning, the change in all these colors and, and stuff was in the in pixelation, um, just a different light, but it was always about skin. And, and skin, it was, um, uh, they were all macro shots so that people, I didn't want people to start saying, oh, there's your eyebrow or, you know, that, that you know, that's a finger or it's, right. Just had to be like like the plane you know of this body of land um and so that's what each one of these units is this was first um exhibited at the um, Kelowna art gallery and the space that i had was this sort of a long rectangular room and i had about maybe uh, maybe about 400 of these and so there are different sizes, um, you know, some can be like that, some some little bit larger. And so there's a whole um, range of uh, scale, color. And so when I started installing the work, I knew that I was setting these things onto the wall in a configuration that would uh, be reminiscent of camps on the plane. Mm -hmm. And so I started installing the work and because I was working down at, toward the end of that, you know, rectangular kind of longish room, it seemed that the more, um, the more of these units uh, went up, the smaller I became. And so it was like, I've always, um, I've always gotten these um, treats, I guess, from the work mm. after spending so much time with it. And so in, in, at that time, what happened was um, it really felt that I, I shrank to their size because I was enveloped. I, I had the cap on my right, I had the cap on my, my left, and then, you know, I was enveloped in that camp. And so it, it really did give that sensation of um you know a change in scale so that it's so really did, each, did each of the cones correlate to someone particular in your life 
Well, it started out with just myself and then um, um, like my family is always involved in my process. And so soon they began to, you know, it would be um, my son's back or my, my granddaughter's hands. And so we just kind of slowly grew from there so that um, after a while, it, when I used up all my family members, I, I started, um, you know, I know, I think once in, in Ontario, at one of the showings, someone brought in a group of uh, young girls or youth that were, I don't know, um, in some kind of program. And so I invited them. And so I, I still recall, like one of them had a mole on her forearm. Mm. So there's some that are recognizable. Uh, and I remember, and so, um, or, or if I'm at a gallery, I'll only invite someone to, if they want to, you know, include themselves in this landscape or bodyscape. Um, so there's that. So this is it starting to go up now. And, um, and so these are, are they're adhered to the wall uh, with just double stick takes. So that's kind of info from like behind the curtain thing. <laughs> um, and so that would be a part of body of land. And so I'll take a shot of that. And like in this case, I find like the vein really beautiful so i'll leave that i won't manipulate that in any way so i don't i don't really use um uh, any sort of uh what computer techie oh, stuff or anything yeah, uh, yeah. so I'll just leave it other than you know like uh copying it and coming in really close so and so like some of them are really odd because some will look like almost like a deep purple, mm -hmm. um, but that's just um, like from it being pixelated or um, the light that was there when when the shot was taken. Mm -hmm. So on the average, <clears throat> and this is, um, I guess, kind of we can go into this area of um, site specificity because uh, again, this is. Uh, nomadic in in the way that it's um it'll fit anywhere so from the first time that it fit into this long u-shaped room uh it's been um maybe on two long sometimes it's been on one long um so it it just uh it it depends on i guess where where it's going to be installed is how how the configuration will end up I like a lot how the, I mean, even just the title body of land, like the, these hands become topographies, you know, like valleys and hills and everything else that starts to read as landscape. Well, that was something that, uh, that I came to understand um, while I was still uh, at this art college. At the art college, I, well, you know how it goes, like you have your studio classes, but you have to have history classes, you know, to to complete your program of study. And to me, the art history classes were like going to the dentist because they were, uh, yes, there was a lot of um, beautiful work that, that I could see. And there was all this history from uh, these masters uh, from Europe, from everywhere else, but none from where I came from. You know, there was no reference to to anything related to me. And so after a while, I just I just quit going to these uh, art history classes, and I would just go to the studio. And um, you know, that's when I came to understand that uh, my work has to be about me or where I come from, or what surrounds me, 
And so it's not, <clears throat> I'm not saying that I'm, I, I'm, I'm creating my own history. It was already there, but I, I accessed it and I wanted to, um, I guess to, by using these materials, by, by referencing skin and, and people and family, um, that's what, that's what, um, it means something to me more than, um, you know. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. living history as well. Like it's, it's not a history that's done, <laughs> you know, so. Oh, exactly, yeah. And, um, and, and in those, in those classes of, uh, like art history, it was all about celebrating, uh, well, for sure, male, white males, yeah. they did um, what they created. And um, when there was reference to, to cultures other than uh, European culture, um, it was always viewed as exotic. Um, and, and that's something that I, something else that I resisted. Uh, and, and so going back to this, um, this approach of uh, celebrating the ordinary, you know, that's a way of um, cutting, cutting you off at the past, you know, like you're not going to say I'm exotic because I use grass or because it's, it's not, it's not like that. It hasn't been like that for a long time. And it's um, maybe for some, it will continue, but um, I, I've never uh, really paid much attention to that. Yeah. Um, in, I think this was about maybe three years ago. I, I began work on, um, well, actually, I, I visited the place first. And so this, the English name is the um, Majorville Medicine Wheel. And, and so there are all, all these um, stone, stone structures. I won't try to, under, you know, explain what, you know, the significance of that is, only that it's a really strong connection to Nichitapi. Um, so these um, stone formations are all throughout Alberta and probably into, you know, across the border. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, in my community, I work with a couple of different programs uh, and, and those programs um, are in place to, to provide a connection uh, for children, children and youth from the blood tribe who are in care. So they're separated from community, they're separated from family, they're in foster care. And so I've been working with this, involved in, with these two programs now for uh, probably about 12 years. Um, and so this one trip, uh, actually Henry was the one that drove us. Um, I think those two are probably. Um, and, uh, so we picked up, we picked up a couple of the youth, some caseworkers, my grandson, Henry was there, um, and, the, and, uh, and then a guide from, from our community who is an art, um, archeologist, he's a land consultant and he's, um, traditionalist and, so we went to this place, he took us to this place and he, he explained um, how important this site was. And so I ended up um, um, using my response to this and, and uh, for, for uh, an installation that was at the Art Gallery of uh, Edmonton, of Alberta in Edmonton. And so it talks about how, how my visit to this place, how it, um, how it affected me, how, 
how deeply it affected me because it was also um, how how the elder explained it. He said it was connected to uh, one of our stories that my grandmother would say about a woman who came. I mean, she was lifted up into the heavens because she fell in love with Morning Star. She got so homesick that the sun and moon allowed her to come back home, but they, you know, they brought her back home with a ceremony as a gift, you know, for her people. And you know, I was told that this is the exact site where she came back to earth. And so it was, it's, to me, I was, you know, I knew the stories were rooted in truth when I would listen to them. I knew there had to be uh, an origin somewhere. And, but that was the first time that, you know, it was re as real as the dirt, as real as the, you know, rocks. That experience was really, um, it was amazing. Yeah, as real as the rocks. I like that phrase, yeah. So that that's a couple of years ago and so um i guess maybe to to talk a little bit about the process but yes i did use images of this throughout the installation but i also used um, um i use in in my work quite a bit collage and so I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday and, and my son and I went to visit a friend and um, I was talking about how it feels to, um, to work with this process of collage and these multiples that I've been using in my work for, for all this time. And it's, um, I guess in a sense, it's, um, it's fragmenting the initial uh, entirety of, you know, this this concept that you're given. Um, but in order to realize it uh, as honestly and as truthfully as possible, you know, you have to take it apart. And so that's what I do physically. You know, I, I have these pictures. I have a whole library of pictures of grass, rip water, skin. Um, and so all those are, are fragmented. And so it, I could easily, I guess, use some sort of computer program and, and do a collage that way it would be done in no time. But what's important for me is that I sit and as I'm, piecing, you know, this whole back together, I'm being uh, given understandings into uh, different aspects. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's yeah. something that I use. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's something too that I've learned to use with uh, when we have these activities for uh, the children and the youth in care, that's something that's that always takes place is that we all have uh, something to occupy their hands as, you know, and then that frees up, you know, any sort of, um, they don't feel they have to talk, but they, you know, they're taking the words in that maybe this elder is, is teaching them, um, but they're not being given this task of like even responding and so they're just absorbing it and so i find that really similar to you know what happens when i'm, when I'm going through my 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 work oh, this is my son Henry. this young man um is is no longer with us he um, he was a year out of the system and you know now he's gone uh, as part of the um, calling stones which was uh, what the, um, um, the, the, the overall exhibit was uh, the title of was called Calling Stones. Um, 
on the wall, I had um, a, a wall of a hillside that I made out of um, units of grass and they were just loosely adhered to the wall. And so it shows this slope of the wall. Um, and so in that, I'm telling the story about how um, when I realized that this place was an actual place, that the story that I was told, it actually took place. And so how I wanted to, to convey that was I, I took pictures of, uh, of course, family photos, and then I just took the outlines and uh, all these little figures in acetate. And they were just, uh, you know, black ink. But also, uh, aside from having like family photos, um, I also took, you know, just random shots of people. So this was from a hotel room in Toronto. And so they would be from different angles too. And so what, that, what I then used uh, of these images, I had them coming in swooping in from from the sky and almost but not yet quite landing on this hillside and to me i explained in the text for the show is that um, um you know it's they were messengers that they were bringing these stories to us and so um I guess that was my, I wanted to honor that site by, you know, by really making a strong reference to a strong, but yet, um, I guess a tr tr there's a transparent, just outlines so that you're not reading the work, just right. something that, that you know, I find kind of, you know, if you're, if you're standing there while well, I'm telling you this now, but you know, at the time, if you were looking at it, you wouldn't know. And then, so that anonymity, anonymity yeah, is really comes through. Yeah. And I, I really like just, you know, that they were taken from different angles and like even his shadow right now as I'm looking at it, that's, that's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then these two, I don't know if they were um, protesting or advertising. I don't know. I, I, but I just sat and watched them from my hotel room. And so when I'm working on something, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a whole range of things that happen. And And, you know, I, and like, I don't mind at all that term minimalist because to me, minimalism is your making room and, you know, for things to happen and for you to, to give information without, you know, um, standing there and explaining it. So you're kind of sharing this, um, expanse uh so we're kind of getting back to what time is it now it's almost yeah at about yeah like five or ten minutes left okay so i'll go through we'll go back to uh i guess the water my work with water this is um from the old man river i had been invited to um uh and um I guess it was an outdoor sculptural uh, exhibit in uh, Fredericton. And so this, it was on someone's acreage and I chose the shoreline across from St. Croix Island. Uh, and so this whole exhibit had been, um, we had been asked to respond to, it was the anniversary of um, De Champlain's uh, landing and it's bringing uh, people to, to settle on this island. Um, and then the first group of people that he left, um, just what I, I read is that uh, they all perished or almost all of them perished that first year. Um, 
And so, I mean, you know, I always kind of take a long way around like responding to or looking at something. So because I was going to be importing my idea to the St. you know, to, to this other river down east, um, and it, it flows into the Bay of Funday. So both really strong rivers. So I went down to the old man, I took pictures of like just crocuses and uh, so I gathered rocks and pebbles and twigs and the pictures that I took I I adhered to to these objects and there was about 200 in all so um, those I, I put along the, the shoreline and this this work is I called camouflage and my my feeling being that uh, you know this is when people first started coming and you know in their mind discovering us um, so you know they could have used some camouflage or, or just a better understanding of like meshing with their environment but first you know the first group of people and the other part of that is that um, I, I was wondering at that time how how it would have been if we had camouflaged ourselves so that we weren't like so-called being discovered. So that's St. Floyd Island right there. And so my work was along this shoreline here. And, and the um, objects were all strewn along here. And then when the, when the tide would come in, I don't know how long it took because I didn't go back and, and check on them, but they would, uh, you know, they weren't, um, again, there was no um, permanence to them. So yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the ephemerality of that sort of. And I didn't yeah. use. Uh, you know, any even the adhesive, you know, it was water based, and so they would all be washed out and just be integrated into into this waterways. Mm -hmm. yes. so, some shots of there, and along with the shots I took of the river environment from the old man, I also took some text from the Blackfoot Dictionary. So there's words here as well. So I placed some uh, words there as well. Um, this was from, um, this opened at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery in the spring and it was open for two weeks before, uh, before the lockdown. Uh, this installation is called Clan and it starts with an image of my grandmother, uh, Kate Three Persons. And so what I wanted to do was um, uh, introduce her to her her granddaughters and her great granddaughters, and to um, to honor her. So we went to the river bottom. There's and the elements in this uh, installation are like this performance. There was documentation of this performance, and I think this was probably uh, one of the coldest days in in October that year. And so I had made these little. Uh, white cotton flags they're just blank they're, and they're and so what the girls did they went out and they just planted these at different times uh, they took turns or they went out in groups and we just documented the whole process so this and, was a performance in the land but then filmed and screened at, in yeah. the yeah and now um, the um um the video was uh, presented in the corner so that there was uh, uh, like it was screened on one side and then screened on this side and so it kind of met. So uh, it was a long, you know, a flat thing. So that the land almost enveloped you in the corner yeah. of your side. And then I had, I wanted it to be close to the floor so that you're not, you know, you're not the boss of that environment. Right. And this is, um, I live in the house that my, my grandmother built. And, um, so this is just the road that 
leads away from leads to and away from the house and the standoff is in that to the south and body of land this is um these are just other units in in the whole library of um you know this this especially i'm i go back to uh images and i see how uh, like this could be hair or yes. you know, be wrinkled skin or um you know I'm, it's it's um it's not a stretch for me to uh to equate that you you know um, and we um just always remembering that we're we're dependent on our environment and we're an extension of it So the work with rivers I've done, it's, I've, I've done, um, uh, I've, I did some work at a residency in uh, Fredericton and then in Winnipeg, uh, just all using images of the different rivers. And so I've had rivers from, uh, from BC, Alberta, Pretty much most of them across Canada. Uh, my one, my first public art project was um, in Edmonton. There's a bridge over Boat Road, and so it was one of the oldest bridges there. And they had a metal grate uh, that you would drive over, and it would just rumble. And so that's. Um, that's what I thought was, I wanted to portray that was that uh, I wanted to keep some of that uh, memory of that, you know, sensation of uh, dizziness and, you know, it being loud and stuff. So there's four of these, two at each end of the bridge, and these, um, the grates have been set into concrete. So if you guys are in Edmonton, you can, it's on. Yeah, it's beautiful. And so this is called slivers. Um, I really admire how people can come up with um, how to create artwork because I have a couple of horror stories about trying to create my own work and some of the swear words that I use, like not good. So these are all paper, folded paper images of different rivers. So and it's uh, displayed in this uh, like a, it's suspended. And these are Epasca. Uh, these are they are dancing. These are the figures. Um, and this is the bowl that I. Uh, tell us tell us a little bit, little bit about how you responded to the the invitation. Um, when you were asked to create a container for water, what, what was the, was this your first instinct or did you come to it a little later? Well, I, I think initially I wanted to, uh, there was one other idea and it involved my, my oldest granddaughter, um, but then there was going to be, um, I wasn't going to be able to keep it or put it in another show. And so I thought, well, I'll shelf that. And so right away came to this and I wanted to blur that um, border of a containment of water. And so I used a clear bowl and I printed images of the Old Man River on tissue. Um, and then that was um, collaged onto the outside because I knew like later on that they would be containers for or water and mm -hmm. uh and so this is what it may be about a 10 inch diameter bowl um yeah. and so i wanted there still to be um uh you know people to see you know the fragility of the water systems now and um you know this is not this is not permanent by any means. And, and it's a very fragile, I guess. And that's my feeling about um, 
you know, not, not just the rivers and lakes, but, you know, our oceans. I shouldn't even say our oceans. I hate using words like that. It's not, it's so as if I own it, you yeah, know. Obsessive. Yeah. So sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Um, yeah, and I find that, uh, I thought it was, it's interesting hearing your talk tonight with regards to this bowl, because you're, you're seeing all these bodies of work that you've done already start to show themselves in this one small iteration because you've got the you know beautiful stones they could be from the river themselves you've got the images of of the river that have been collaged the, the repetitive uh gestures of the photography that you normally do so like there's a lot of these other former works you've done really encapsulated into this one work and my my um my family is a big part of my work and so in each each work that I do, it's I always I'm assisted, you know, by my sons, my daughters, my granddaughters, my grandson. Um, they all participate. They're all part of my process. And so the rocks that were collected, they were from the Old Man River, and that was my granddaughter went down the hill to. to oh, awesome. uh, this is called To the East, and it's another one of my acts of obsession where I took pictures of the Valley Butte smoke once yeast uh, and this is still ongoing I haven't I, I add to it once in a while but for a while there I would uh, just there was a spot in in the yard here that I would go and I would take pictures because it's it's like to the east and so um, I think initially what I was wondering is that is there a way that I can imprint this um, this horizon um, so that if you know if, if could I just memorize it? But what ended up being was that uh, instead of stabilizing itself or imprinting itself um, in my memory, it just threw me a curveball and just showed me that even if I took in these pictures like three times a day of the same day they would all be so different yeah yeah so unstable yeah and so that's and very you know like i'm uh, most of the time some of them are taken with a you know with a nice camera most of the time it's just my phone you know then we're back. Then we're done. <laughs> Thank you, Faye, for sharing those images um, and telling some of those stories. You, you've had a, a long practice, but you were, you selected some really great ones for us tonight to kind of illustrate your process, and uh, I really appreciate it. I think we are uh, we got about five to ten minutes where we can field some questions. Uh, I'm going to introduce our colleague, uh, our marketing and communications coordinator, Kate Silver, who has been collecting some questions. Kate, can I ask you to join the call? There she is. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Faye, I've got a few questions here from the audience, and I'm welcoming everybody else to come forward if they have anything else we can try to get on screen tonight. Um, but the first question is, uh, you use a lot of repetition in your practice, for an example, an almost diaristic approach with photography. Is there something inherent to photography that appeals to you with regards to that tendency of repetitive gestures? It's it's just the ease of, you know, it's like you're you're blinking, you're seeing it, but it's being recorded. And you know, it's just I guess the access to to building up um, you know, this library of images, even though they're, I'm not planning to work towards something, maybe at that time, I'll, I'll record it and then, I'm, you know, just add it. And I just, I think of it as a library now that I can go to and, um, and just use those images. I get the sense that you're bringing along your, is it just your camera phone that you're, you just take around on walks or are you bringing along like a, an SLR big camera or what are you using to do this? I camera, but even, even though I have a nice camera, I like, it's like, you know, you know, the trouble we had starting this Zoom. 
Uh, I'm not, you know, even with the big camera, I'll probably just have it on one setting automatic. And so what's the sense of that, you know? And, and it goes back to it's, you know, being, uh, you know, it's not photography. It's, it's you know, they're images. Mm. When you think of them as photographs, because then you're kind of freezing them and you're adding kind of another layer of um, stability to it. Because what I'll end up doing is I'll be cutting it up anyway or doing something. Right. All right, so we've got uh, two more questions here and so you can again uh, type your question in the Q&A field if anyone wants to participate. Um, the next question from the audience was, uh, was Yoko's practice, including her decades long devotion to spreading the message of love and peace familiar to you? And were you influenced by her work? I was familiar with with her work and you know just John Lennon's message of peace and it's and so it's not something that's uh that's a reach because you know I'm in my 60s and and so I come from that time where um you know the days of hippies and stuff like that and so of course uh you know at the very beginning that's what that's what you um, I guess that's what you look to is that you know feeling of of peace and calm um, and her work it's uh, it's almost like she removes herself from it and I really see uh, similar you know a similar take of how my grandmother used to tell stories and I would stop hearing her voice and it would be just a story and so with maybe her work it's you know this art and it's not you know like a stamp you have to put on anything but for sure you know like you know I, you know at some point that used to be um uh, something that you, you you tell people that are kind of still stuck in those days, you say 60s are over, man, you know, but you know, I can't say that anymore because 60s ain't over yet. <laughs> That's great. It, uh, I think you said earlier too, like her work has a certain um, deceptive simplicity as well that I think, you know, it's, it's a lot of it is that process, not the product, which your work is very similar. So, I, you know, there's a lot of overlaps that uh, I find interesting. All right, I've got one more question here. Um, how do you see the land and water as an extension of the body and our social connections? Mm. It's, we gotta flip that around because the land is not an extension of us or what yeah it, it we affect it by what we do but we're extensions of it and so you know that's that's what i really see is that um you we 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 have to be humble we have to be humble in in and coming to an understanding uh, of, of our relationship to, to our environment. And I remember one time I was thinking about uh, just the expanse of the prairie and how you could see for miles around. And I, and I you know, just in a, in a moment, I was sort of imagining myself like, you know, on, on a turntable, you know, for a record, record turntable. And I was thinking, you know, like I'm, I'm surrounded. I'm, you know, I got the feeling that I was in the center and then in the, you know, just in the very next second, I was made to feel like, no, you're insignificant. You're not, you're not at the center, you know? So those realizations can be just, can take place in, you know, if you're listening to your work and you're, 
And I think that's what happens when I'm spending time touching the paper, touching the grass. Um, um, I'm told, you know, I get, I get to communicate with the material. We've got one, one last question from the audience here. Uh, it says, you had mentioned you thought you would use your granddaughter first for this water event piece, but you switched to using a bowl. How were you going to use your granddaughter? Well, I'll save that one because I'm still going to use it, but it was, she was going to be water. Let's just put it that way. But I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> Great. Um, well, that's great timing. It's at the end of our hour. So we've had a lovely chat and, and, uh, and some great questions. Thank you so much, Faye, for sharing your time and your energy. Uh, you're very generous with your, with that tonight. Uh, I look forward to talking to you more and I would encourage everyone to come down to contemporary Calgary and, and see your, your work in the exhibition in water event and in Yoko Ono's growing freedom. So thanks very much to you again. Thank you, everyone.